Exactly. Hey, welcome to the restaurant, <laughs> the restaurant coach podcast. Uh, it is the cure for the common restaurant. I am joined today by my good friend, Carl Osborne, who, if you don't know, he's been on the podcast before. He is the author, along with Marilyn Sandlin, of Delivering the Digital Restaurant. Carl, man, I've been, I've been following you on social media. You've just been like whirlwind traveling lately. How's it been? What, what time zone am I in, Donald? I, I don't know whether to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, but uh, it's good to see you again. Let's put it that way. <laughs> good to see you. It's good to see you, my friend. And I want to get Carl on the, on the podcast today because, you know, of course, if you don't know, there is an event coming up. I have my annual event every October. It's called the Restaurant Success Summit. For three days here in Scottsdale, Arizona, I bring together some world-class industry experts to talk about some really dynamic topics. And I, of course, I want to bring Carl down because we're going to talk about delivering the digital restaurant. He's got a couple really hot new topics that he, and we're going to talk about this in a second. They're going to segue into, if you haven't read his first book yet, please go out and get the first book, Delivering the Digital Restaurant. Highly recommend it. A fantastic book. It's probably, it's on my list of the top reads for 2022. You got to grab a copy because you want to get ready for round number two. And what is the second book going to be called? Well, it's called the same name, Delivering the Digital Restaurant, but we're calling it The Path to Digital Maturity, Donald. Ooh, and so digital in that, maturity. Yeah. Well, look, we're, we're in a different era now, right? We're, we're in this kind of post-pandemic era, and we're trying to help restaurants think about, okay, now it's no longer spray and pray to survive. It's actually right. how you diligently strategize a path forward into a, a future where you can embrace digitization, but in a methodical manner. And so that we, we'll, we'll cover some of that. Oh, very, very cool. And then you're also, you just took a operating, you're a chief operating officer at a new company out there called Juicer. Yeah, Juicer. Yeah. It's uh, juicerpricing.com. We're helping restaurants with dynamic pricing. Um, in fact, quite honestly, we're helping restaurants with pricing because I don't know about you, Donald, but I think restaurants generally really struggle with pricing. It's a very difficult big time. Thing. It's one of the biggest things I deal with all the time is that they is just don't really? know how to price. You know? Yeah, it's and it's tough. And guess what? With all this inflation happening, both on mm. cost of products as well as on labor, it's even more difficult right now. Uh, and so I've teamed up with uh, an excellent co-founding group from the, the travel sector, quite honestly, the, the former CEO of Jetsetter, the former CMO of Kayak, and our mm. CEO has built and sold businesses in the e-commerce space of travel. And um, we've, we've really built this algorithm to really apply pricing artificial intelligence for all intents and purposes to help restaurants think about when to price different items in different ways. Right. And uh, obviously I'll be talking a little bit more about this to the folks that attend your summit. Yeah. So just real quickly, let's kind of just, and I don't want you to give away too much. You know, I want, you got to come to the summit to get the really good stuff, but just on the, just on the real kind of high level, how does this dynamic pricing thing work with a restaurant? Yeah. So, I want to be completely transparent. This is early days for a lot. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. This is like, this is like, this is like cutting edge stuff, man. I'm telling you, this is like yeah. really cool. Because I saw, I actually saw your guys' booth when I was at the Western Food Expo. I was speaking there, and I saw the booth for Juicer. I was like, oh my god, that's Carl's new place. You know, the new company he's working with and stuff like that. And the one he's leading the team on. And I was just like, I was just, and I was taking some of the information in, and it looks really, really, really cool. Yeah. So what we're doing is, first of all, taking a year's worth of POS data mm -hmm. from the restaurant, understanding every transactional level item detail associated to when certain items are bought and when certain items are perhaps not purchased as often. Right. That allows us to build a forecast. Right. That forecast is then utilized in a way to then make recommendations on prices of different products at different times. And that allows the algorithm to learn which products are elastic which means respond more to price changes and which are inelastic. You might have seen this week, Donald, uh, Costco have said they're never changing the price of their hot dog. Why? Oh, yeah. Because it's a, it's a traffic draw, right? Same kind of thing happens across many other types of products. But you'd be really surprised, I think, to know that many products that we sell, the customer is not as aware of that price as perhaps you might think they are. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was at a, um, a conference recently and I asked, this isn't statistic re statistically relevant, but I was asking 10 or 15 people around me, what's the price of a grande latte at Starbucks, right? Probably one of the most purchased food items across the country today. And the answers that I got were anywhere from 450 to 650. 
And so right there tells you that people have a $2 swing yeah. in their minds as to what they might pay. Now, what we're trying to do, we're trying to say, well, at the moment, dynamic pricing is happening. The DoorDash is the Uber Eats of this world. They do are it. indeed doing yeah. it. You can pay an extra $3 and get your food delivered in 20 minutes as opposed to 40 minutes if you want to. They are also using their driver availability to change the price of the delivery itself, right? So if they don't have many drivers, they will either extend out the time or they might increase the price. So all of that is showing that, you know, the, the aggregators, the marketplaces are using it today, but the restaurant isn't sharing in any of that, in any of that prize. Um, I put an article out in June of this year because I, I write for nationsrestaurantnews.com as yeah. well, Donald, and uh, it was about throttling. And in that space, we were trying to say there are a lot of restaurants that now are starting to succeed with either third-party market optimization or having their own first-party ordering channel. And now they're getting too many digital orders. So what they're doing, they're shutting their orders off. They're saying, no, I can't, exactly. I, they're, cl they're closing their virtual doors. Mm -hmm. And you'd, you would never do that in a brick and mortar setting. You would never shut your virtual, uh, your actual doors. You'd invite the customer in, you'd give them a menu, wait wait by the bar perhaps, right? And have a drink and then we'll, we'll come and get you when your table's ready. Mm -hmm. In a virtual setting, restaurants are throttling themselves and therefore are closing out the opportunity to gain those new customers. Now, if I was to say we could avoid throttling by perhaps increasing the price of most of your main entrees by 50 cents, only a small amount, that can reduce the level of demand you get for into, into your restaurant and therefore allows you to still keep your digital doors open. It also allows you to maintain consistency in terms yeah. of your customer's eyes and potentially acquire new customers. Similarly, on the flip side, you know, happy hours are probably the most obvious form of dynamic pricing that exists today. Mm -hmm. So how can you actually customize um, prices to be reduced at times to either grow traffic volume or perhaps more pertinently, if, certainly if the, the restaurant isn't going to market it, you could actually use it to grow the tray value. So maybe you reduce the price of the side, so that way you grow your tray value in such a way that actually you're getting more from those customers that are right, coming right. in at different times of day. Where, where the technology allows, how about incentivizing your customers to order ahead an hour or two? And actually say, if you order ahead an hour or two to let me know when you want your food, I might give you a discount. So all of these different things are how mm -hmm. dynamic pricing is going to be able to help. And ultimately, that means better margin in the lowest margin channel for, for restaurants. Yeah, this stuff is like super exciting to me. I think it's going to be like the new wave of the future. And like you said, every other industry in the world does it already. You know, I know it's like on Uber, like I'm at the airport. It depends on like, you know, I'll go in and look like I'm getting, a, I'm getting off the plane. I'll look at like, you know, what the Uber is going to cost. I'll get a certain price. And then an hour later after I get my bag, I go back and the price has changed. You yep. know, like all the time, yep. I'm like, oh, I yeah. should have it then, you know. <laughs> and, that, and that journey starts earlier, right? The flight, that the, the guy that you sat next to on the flight probably paid a different price to you. And probably the hotel did. you stay at tonight, you're probably paying a different price to the person next door to you. So it is happening all over. And it's already happening in restaurants. You know, there was um, I think a, a donut chain that was doing something in link to gas prices. You've got cinemas now choosing to change the price of their uh, tickets depending on the time of day as well. Yeah. So... I think customers are coming increasingly used to the idea that they might pay a different price. Right. The difference is it doesn't need to be abusive, right? It doesn't need to be abusive. And no, also no, no. Um, it needs to be something that helps them feel that as a result, they're getting a better experience. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I, I talk about throttling earlier. The reason restaurants do that is they're concerned about reducing the quality output of what's being created in their kitchen, both for their on-premise guests as well as for their off-premise guests. And so with that, with that in mind, it's actually about making sure we can address probably the biggest challenge in off premise right now. You know, everything I wrote about in the book on speed, um, speed, accuracy and quality is because consistency drops during those busier times. And so if this can help improve consistency of, of off premise, that's a good thing for everyone. That's perfect. No, that's perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I'm really excited about having you come down to the summit and talked about this at a deeper level for people because you know, and like you said, the big chains have been doing it for years. I mean, you just said like Starbucks. I mean, you don't pay the same price for, you know, a, a you know, a venti latte in L.A. that you do in Phoenix, Arizona. I mean, this price is totally yep. different. And also, too, like even in Phoenix, the price is a little bit different depending on where I'm at in Phoenix even. Sure. And what we're going to be doing is overlaying weather data, right? So how, how, how does how does a latte change when it's super cold outside relative to when it's super hot? Should it be at a different price? 
depends on where you are, right? Of course, if you're up in Toronto, Canada, it might be a very different answer to that to where you are in Arizona. And so all of those different data feeds play into it. Similarly, understanding the competitor pricing, the competitor right. density, uh, understanding how many people are servicing last days in your particular region, for example. And what we're doing at Juicer Pricing is building a database of every competitor price across the United States. So that way that also feeds into the algorithm so that we know what your competitors are doing and when they change their price too. Oh, so cool. That is going to be so, so amazing. I can't, I'm looking so forward to just sitting down. I know I have a couple of people that are going to probably like, you know, want to bend your ear and grab you and, and talk about this in a little more detail. And then that also leads me into that next kind of topic that you mentioned earlier, digital maturity. What really is digital maturity? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, where you and I go to these conferences, Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know you in particular keep a, a fine eye out for the independent operators. And when you think of the independent operator, um, we have a forward in, in the book here um, from an independent operator. Their mindset is, OK, I get it. I, you know, they, they've gone, they've, they've, they've moved on from where we were perhaps pre-pandemic. And now they're saying, OK, I, I see the I see that this is important. Mm -hmm. But they come into one of these big conferences, Donald. They see hundreds of exhibits in front of them. And they say, where the heck do I start? Where, where, where on earth do I do it? And there are now hundreds of different solutions. I, I call this term the sassification of our industry. The software oh, wow. as a server service and sassification of our industry has now enabled the independent restaurateur to compete with the very biggest of chains that five, six years ago were plowing millions of dollars mm. into the technology that today you can get for a monthly exactly. fee. Yeah. And so... Digital maturity is about how do you know when to embrace another bit of technology? How do you know when to actually build your tech stack in an appropriate way to where you are, where your customers are, to where your team are, and to the capacity you have to truly utilize the technology that you've got in front of you? There are so many restaurants right now that have access to technology that they're probably only using 30% of its features and functions. And that's a travesty because uh, that, that, that technology, that functionality can really help them grow to another level. So in this new book that we're going to release out later this year, um, under the same name, Delivering the Digital Restaurant, but the path to, to digital maturity, it's going to be a playbook. It's a, it's a third of the size of the original. So it's very easy to read and get through in a weekend. It's just going to break down what do you want to focus on first? And how do you really want to think through the journey of evolution in becoming a digital restaurant? And as I, uh, as I mentioned that, I, uh, and I'll do this in, uh, at the workshop, and I'll ask everyone, how many of you believe you're a digital restaurant today? Right. And when I ask that question in front of conferences and I ask people to raise their hands, the, the, there's probably about 50% of hands never go up. I ask, were well, you a digital restaurant five years ago, three years ago, now are you going to be one in two years? And half the hands never go up. And I'm going, is it my accent? Do they not understand? Not? Yeah. Well, your accent's uh, fine. You're fine. Uh, your accent's fine. Yeah. And of course, when I speak to the people afterwards, they go, well, what is a digital restaurant, Carl? I mean, you didn't explain that. I said, exactly. Ah, uh, exactly. And, That's and, it. And the point is, is that a digital restaurant, in my mind, is being wherever your customers are. And Donald, they're on this thing. They're on they're they're on that five six hours a day, right? Um, when you're Easy. posting your feeds on Instagram and Facebook, you're you're pushing mm -hmm. those kind of things out there because that is where customers, even restaurateurs, are. And so this is where, for us, I think we need to think about how this journey is evolving because the customer today is not just a customer that has food delivered. They're not just a customer that goes through the drive through. They choose the channel that is right for them based on where they are through the course of their, their week. And the more we get to a place where we evolve as a digital restaurant to be wherever our customers want them to be, and that's largely through the digital interfaces that they engage with, the more we are going to be better positioned to service them. That's going to be so cool. Yep, that is so right. So looking at in the future and looking at, you know, you go to all these conferences too. What do you think are some really cool like tech companies up and coming besides Juicer? I mean, I think Juicer is definitely on my my watch list. That's a great question. Um, so one of the banes of many companies right now is the, the challenge to integrate. Oh, so yeah. um, 
there's so many different bits of technology, but whether they integrate with the core POS in some way is a, is a real challenge. So there are platforms like Cube Beyond POS that are doing great things in being able to make that a lot easier. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, Toast do some great things as well in helping a lot of the independent operators with yep. numerous bits of functionality. But those that are trying to help restaurants manage their data better, of course, we're helping from a pricing perspective, a, a juicer mm -hmm. pricing. But those that are helping the restaurant utilize their data really effectively, I think are the ones that I particularly uh, am drawn to. So there are companies like Bicky, um, there are companies like a Aben that are helping from a data platform Oh, wow. um, really help customer data be better managed. So you can target um, lapsed customers in a way that you'd never be able to do before. Then you've got companies like Crunch Time and Galley that are helping restaurants take a better handle on their cost of product data so that you move away from just theoretical cost of product to actual cost of product and really understand how those movements, again, with the inflationary environment we're in, oh, yeah. are affecting your, your, your bottom line. And then you've got companies like Seven Shifts that are, are helping restaurants with user, using their, their labor force in a more optimized manner. So you're scheduling people to exactly when the forecast says you need them. So those companies that are helping restaurants use data more effectively and, and applying algorithms to help them ge generate an informed forecast, I think those are, are really exciting. Of course, everyone probably answers this question when you ask them, oh, it's, it's the drone companies and, and all these kind of folks. And oh, drones yeah. and robotics are coming. But the, the, anything around automation, which is helping the restaurant do things simply, and that can obviously be in data, those, that's where automation right now is having uh, most presence. And, you know, that, that we actually, um, I'm sure you know of our podcast on or the, the Monday Minute that my co-author oh, really put thing. out. Um, we had this, what, this subject last week where we said, where is automation the most important right now? And I, and I think that is something which a lot of restaurants that are looking to invest in this are asking themselves because it's not always robotic arms and uh, autonomous vehicles. <laughs> it's things like it's things like uh, smart cookers. And you know, the example we said in the Monday Minute podcast uh, was Starbucks, right? I, I don't know whether you saw that one, Donald, but they they introduced something. Wait for it, an ice machine, ah. an, an ice machine, um, which is now taking the the time it takes to make a frappuccino from a minute and thirty seconds to thirty seconds. Oh, Those wow. 60 seconds add up. They add up in terms of the Ooh, time and the labor you have, but it also improves the customer's ability to get that frappuccino. So this is where automation is going to be heading. I think companies that are helping automation in that sense uh, are certainly on, on a right path. Very, very cool. Yeah, and the Monday Minute, where can people find the Monday Minute at? Well, it's available on all main podcast platforms. Um, if folks want to register on our platform, it's learn.delivery, uh, website www.learn.delivery. Um, and if they if they haven't read our main book here, happy to get a copy out. If uh, if they want to get a discount, uh, because embracing first party ordering is what we're all about, right, Donald? That's it, that's uh, use, the, use the coupon code uh, REST25 and you'll get 25% off. Ooh, that's a great deal. REST25, yeah. get a deal, get a coupon. And uh, actually, uh, I'm going to be I'm going to be getting some books from Carl. I'll be buying some books and giving them out as uh, some prizes at the Restaurant Success Summit in October. So the Restaurant Success Summit, if you haven't heard, October 24th, 25th, 26th, three days here in Scottsdale, Arizona. It goes from, we go from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's going to be at a private residence this year. I'm not doing it at a hotel because I keep the I keep the event really intimate and small, and I cap it at 50 people. That way, like you know. In between sessions, you know, you see Carl walking around. You want to grab him real quick and bend his ear and ask him a couple questions. He's available for you. So many times we go to these big conferences and, you know, the speakers get up and talk and then they basically take off and they disappear and you don't really ever see them again. The, the Restaurant Success Summit is more of a it's more of an intimate kind of idea that I wanted people to be able to, t to talk and have, you know, have a good time. And then like, you know. Monday night after the, the day of sessions, we're going to have a, a pizza pool party uh, at the at the at the location. You went mute again, by the way, Carl. There you go. And then uh, on Tuesday, we're doing a taco. I'm just, I'm, I'm just letting you have your moment. Don't oh, I know. Right? And, then, yeah. and then Tuesday night, we're doing tacos and tequilas. I know Carl wants tacos and tequilas. So. Def I definitely do. Are you cooking? I'm cooking. I'm, I am actually cooking on Tuesday. There you go. Even cooking. better. Yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be fun. So you can always head over to uh, restaurantsuccesssummit.com, grab a ticket if you'd like to. Uh, we'd, we'd love to have you there, love to see you there. Tickets are selling out pretty fast. This event does sell out, so it will be sold out by the time the event runs around, which I'm always happy about. 
uh, and, and that Monday minute, like you said, Carl said, you can uh, you pick up on any of your places. I listen to it. On, I like Spotify, so I listen to it on Spotify myself. But that's me. nice. Yeah. yeah, I think I think everyone has their chosen platform typically, don't they? I mean, they do, they uh, do. there's a lot of folks that, in fact, I tell you one thing that surprised me, Donald. Uh, I, I love the Belgians right now. I, I heard that the Monday Minute is the 17th most popular business management podcast in Belgium. That's I've, really never cool. talk, I've never talked about food tech in Belgium at all once, I don't think. But thank you, Belgium. I appreciate it. You want know, to know what's funny is the Restaurant Coach podcast is really big in Germany. Oh really? Oh, well, I, I don't know. I don't know any German. I never talk in German. <laughs> but I'm like a. I'm like. I'm like the David Hasselhoff in Germany. I'm telling you, it's horrible. It's Dankeschön. <laughs> Dankeschön. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we actually and actually at the Restaurant Success Summit, there's uh, people come from all over the world. I actually have some people coming from England. I've got a couple people coming. Already told me they're coming from Australia. I mean, great. it's going to be a fun event, so it's going to be a great time. You've got a great bunch of people coming. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of friends of mine from the industry as well. And so I think you have uh, created a great group of people. And then, you know, I'll be there just to make up the numbers. But the, the, the other group that you've got is certainly worth <laughs> on. Yeah, so if you don't know who's coming to the event for the Restaurant Six Sum Summit, of course, I'm speaking. Uh, I've also got Bruce Irving from, from Smart Pizza Marketing is going to be there. Carl's going to be there. It's kind of like my digital maverick. I got a great culinary leader. Uh, Chef James Avery, he is a chef owner of a couple of great restaurants in uh, New Jersey. He also, a lot of people don't know, he also was the he was the blue chef for Gordon Ramsay's Hell's Kitchen for like four seasons. So he's got a lot of tenure, a lot of great experience, and he's going to really kind of open the doors up for some people talking about getting life work balance back because we talk about it a lot. Uh, I got Yagao Dado from San Diego. Great leadership speaker is going to be there. Uh, Bo Bryant, he's a really good friend of mine. He lives here in Scottsdale. He's going to be speaking, of course. And then I've got uh, I got Nico coming in. He's going to talk a little bit about uh, meal kits. He has a really great meal kit company that he launched with his restaurant, California Grill. And then also we got Zach Oates from Ovations. And he has the best hair in the industry. Zach even better, even better than yours, Donald. Hair. Dude, his hair is like I only aspire to have hair as good as him. And then you, you would be my next uh, person I'd want to have hair like. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know I, how you do it, man. I don't know how you get up there like that. Well, well maybe, maybe we should, do, maybe we should put a session together, Zach and I doing our hair, hair and and that, hair that might be useful. You never know. That might be actually Bone, bonus good. content. There you go. <laughs> so hey, I know you've been traveling a lot lately. What was the best meal you've had lately? Uh, well. I, I don't know whether you know this, but my wife, uh, Alicia, and I, we got married in Amalfi. She wanted to get married to an Italian man, so we negotiated and decided to get married <laughs> in it Italy instead. And uh, we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary. That's awesome. And uh, we were back in Amalfi a, a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, going back to all the old haunts that we celebrated with our wedding party back then. But uh, in our little mini-moon, we stayed in this Monastero Santa Rosa, which is in between Amalfi and Positano. It's 18 rooms. It's got this beautiful infinity pool that pulls over, that pull, oh, goes wow. over the uh, over the cliff, and the restaurant there is just immense. It's like a, a culinary delight, and the, the team are just fantastic, and the cocktails are great. I have a, a, a more fondness for a Aperol Spritz than I ever have had before, um, and to be honest. I won't even tell you about the food because it's the occasion. And I think when we think about our favorite restaurant experiences, mm -hmm. it's not always just about the food. It's about the setting. It's about the ambience. And it just reminds me as to why that is such a special thing. So a lot of fond memories about Monastero Santa Rosa and uh, checking that place out a few weeks ago. Oh, very, very cool. What, what's your kind of go-to uh, like food in Italy? Do you like the pastas or what kind of pasta do you like? Or do you like, you know, what, what's your thing? I mean, I do, I don't, I don't really have a particular type of pasta that I like. I, I like always this, uh, the squid ink tagliatelle is, is a favorite. Yeah, um, yeah. But quite honestly, I mean, something as simple as a caprese salad, when you get to enjoy the, the richness of a tomato that's come from mm. the Italian soil of, you know, so, somewhere in Pompeii somewhere with all that beautiful volcanic soil, it's, it's just another level. And so it's not about a, a dish. It's about the ingredients that service that dish. And a caprese salad with beautiful basil and mozzarella, that's, that's a game changer for me. So um, it's a strange one because if you read the words of most of the dishes I like, it, it's like, eh. 
but actually until you actually sample the Italian fare itself, it's it, it in many ways sometimes puts a, a bit of a negative experience for me on, on many of the Italian restaurants I experience over here. Much like when I go to a Mexican restaurant in England, quite honestly, you know, the, the Mexican food here in Southern California is amazing, but go, go and have a Mexican dish over in London, yeah, it's not always as good. That was good. I have to say, some of the best dim sum I've ever had, though, was in London. <laughs> ah, there you go. Well, it's it's such a diverse kind of city, so maybe yeah. I'm doing London a disservice, but go, go a little out, outside Square. of London. Leicester Square. I never forget. It was in Leicester Square. Yeah? Do you remember yeah. the name? I can't remember the name, but I just remember it was like on the corner. It was like the best dim sum. They had the really cool traditional cart. Came around. It was the first time I tried. I, I was probably like, I was young. I was in the military back then. I was probably 19 and uh, it was the first time I tried like chicken feet. It was amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, I, I think that's why uh, travel is so appealing for me because you, you get to sample just the different types of food and the way in which people interpret food in different locations. You know, my, my favorite ever dining experience was probably now 12 years ago in Thailand uh, oh, off the coast of Phuket. I asked a taxi driver to take me to somewhere I'd never forget. And he took Alicia and I to this uh, area where we took a dragon boat out to a floating pontoon about, um, I don't know, um, probably half a mile off the coast. Oh, wow. This floating pontoon. And we get on, there's a bunch of tables there. And I think oh, this is kind of interesting. And they hand us a net. And in the middle of the pontoon is this kind of area where they've gone and brought all the fish from earlier in the day. And you, you fish the actual fish that you'd like to actually you scoop it up and they go and then uh, cook it for you. And the sun was setting over the, the kind of hills of Phuket. And my goodness, was that an amazing setting. Oh, that sounds amazing. What would you say? I mean, so, you you know, you, traveling to Europe and, you know, and you and I spoke this last March at the Hospitality Innovation Planet in Madrid. We we're very, very fortunate to be a, you know, to be able to speak there. What would you say is um, the biggest difference between dining in Europe and dining in the United States? Portion size. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Portion size. Um, true. Portion true. size and speed of service. You know, you, you go out for a meal in many of like the Italy's, the France's, the Greece's, and you'll you'll be in a place there where you'll it, it's all about just enjoying the the evening, the occasion. Whereas yeah. I think, and I think part of that is driven a little bit about how the labor force is compensated in Europe relative to to the totally U.S. Different. Because of course you're you're driven more by table turns here. Certainly your, your server is more driven by table turns and being able to get people in and out as quickly as possible. So in that sense, you could argue the American model is certainly more commercialized. Um, but then you could also say, and I, I think I mentioned this to you in Madrid, that before the pandemic, at least the U.S. restaurant industry was second only to Japan in restaurants per capita. So what does that mean? Is that it was incredibly competitively intensive for mm. American restaurants to succeed. And so over time, people have increased portion sizes as a way of being able to compete against each other, but at the same time, dwindling their own margins. And when you look at the food waste epidemic that we have in the US, what is it, 50% or so being sure. thrown away? Yeah. Um, it tells me that actually, what can we do to be able to accommodate portion sizes into a, 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 suitable, a suitable size relative to the value that people are willing to pay. And I think maybe what we're seeing through the inflation right now is that that is going to be accommodated. Portion sizes might come down a bit to be able to accommodate the the, the cost that people are having to pay. They need to actually. I mean, they, truly, they totally need to. Hey, I think we've gotten out of control. Bigger is not always better. You know, <laughs> in the US we always say the thing, bigger is better. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's an interesting one. And um, I think b both both markets have amazing restaurants. Um, I hope, I hope uh, quite sincerely that the independent restaurant uh, uh, continues to thrive in the US. I think they're under a lot of pressure right now from a, a lot of different forces, whether they be um, you know, various different legal things or the, the kind of labor challenges that are existing. Um, for me, the independent restaurants give us the best memories of, of eating out. Oh, um, I think a lot of the big chains help us with the convenience of life, but mm -hmm. the, the independents really are the lifeblood of our industry. And so that is why we wrote the book, quite honestly, to, to help them look upon digitization, to help them look upon the this new channel of off-premise to, to be more positive about the, the future that's to come because we're building the muscles right now. We're building the muscles and the muscle memory to enable us to be more agile as we then break forward into even further innovation in the years ahead. 
So you mentioned that before the pandemic, the United States was like was was second as far as second only to Japan to own where, restaurants per capita. Where are we now? I don't know. I haven't seen this. I haven't seen the data since. I mean, we lost what a hundred thousand restaurants. Yeah, we lost quite a few. So um, it might be a little lower down the list, but it tells you how intense the com competition, competition is. is. And what's your, what's your go to fast food place? Your your for convenience. What's your fast Chick food? Chick fil A. Yeah, I have to tell you, I, I was going to say Chick fil A too. Yeah, I just I, and look, I I love it because I, I enjoy the food. But again, from a digital interface, they've really created a frictionless mm -hmm. a frictionless way to be able to engage with their first party platform. You know, yeah. and I think uh, one of the slides I'll put up at your workshop uh, gives a representation of what Chick fil A's business is between third party and first party orders. Right. And the surprising thing is, not just Chick fil A, but the Chipotle's and the, and the Panera's of this world, is there's a decent proportion between mm -hmm. third party, first party uh, customers. And there's a smallest proportion, you know, I'm talking five, 10% of customers choose to use both. And so I, I share that as a message to everyone to say, you need to embrace both third party channels as well as your own ordering channel. But I love the Chick fil A first party ordering channel because you can pay through it, you can order, um, you can yeah. use it for dining orders, you can use it for delivery. And similarly, you've got that kind of loyalty component uh, as well. And so when you have that uh, trifecta of, of items, I think it really helps you be able to uh, really capture the customer's attention to always use that as the means to order going forward. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you got to take advantage of every every revenue stream you can take advantage of, you need to take advantage of. Yeah, yeah. you can't like shut them all. So again, if you want to grab tickets, meet Carl in person, get a copy of the book. You can always go to his website is deliveringthedigitalrestaurant.com. Use the coupon code. What was the coupon code again? REST25, R-E-S-T 25. You get 25% discount. Um, and from that, you can also uh, get a paperback if you prefer paperbacks. Or if you'd like to hear my dulcet tones read the book to you, uh, we'll send you an audio book token as well. I do. I actually, I have, I have your book. I have the hardcover. I have the Kindle, and I also have the audio available too. Uh, you, you, you do actually. You do a great. I wish I had. I'm going to be honest with you. I have not narrated my own books, you know, because uh, I don't have that really cool you know, accent like you do. I work on it every day, Donald. Every day. It's it just is? practice. It's practice. You wake up in the morning and you don't have it, and you just you talk like an American or what? Well, maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm a trained actor. That's what, what I'm, I'm like a Daniel Day Lewis. I, I'm working towards a big part where I have to have an English accent. Ah, oh, you're not really from England. Maybe I'm, exactly. I have a lot of people think I'm from Australia, which is uh, it always gets me. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, let's not let's not even go there. <laughs> <laughs> Delivering the digital restaurant .com. Please check it out. Check out Carl's books. Hop on any of your podcast platforms. Check out the Monday Minute. Him and Meredith do a great job of that. It's a it's easy. You know what I love about his podcast? It's so easy to consume. It's super fast, super easy to digest. And you know, you just it's easy, and yeah, that easy. makes it convenient for everybody. Thank, thanks for that, Donald. I mean, we, we, we really try to make it into a place where it's five five items, five headlines of just yeah. things that are happening in our space, restaurants, tech, off-premise, and we don't sell anything. You know, We're not selling anything. We're not getting these little sponsor yeah. messages that come up. It's all about helping the industry because, my yeah. goodness, do we need it? We need some help. We definitely need some help. And if you want to grab tickets to the Restaurant Success Summit, head over to Restaurant Success Summit pretty straightforward.com and we will see you in Scottsdale October 24th 25th 26th three days bring a notebook you're going to have lots of great information lots of takeaways uh, usually everyone fills up a huge notebook and stuff like that there'll be all kinds of great bonuses and stuff like that it's going to be amazing just head over to restaurant success summit.com grab a ticket and I want to say thanks Carl for taking time today Talk a little bit, a little tease out about dynamic pricing. Uh, that's exciting. And also digital maturity, which is the new book. We'll talk about that step-by-step -step formula, how to make sure your restaurant is following the path to digital maturity. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs>